We're in a second, we'll be sharing the T on how to build a retirement and benefits packet for yourself and your nonprofit staff. But if you've never met me before, I'm Sabrina uh, Walker Hernandez, and I'm the founder of Supporting World Hope, a nonprofit consulting company. I started after 25 years in the industry. And we have with us today, Adam Swartz. Did I say your last name right, Adam? Yes, you did. All right. He's the president and financial advisor of uh, AMIN, Amen. I mean, I mean, okay, financial planning and advisory service. Um, so before we get started, can you click the, if you're watching live or even in replay, can you click the like or heart button if you can hear me loud and clear and let me know where you're watching from? Um, this is going to help us with our Facebook algorithms. Um, the more interaction we have, um, the better it is um, to get to get this showing. Um, so, um, if you could do that for me, that will be great. Any heart or where you're from um, will, will help us. Um, and Adam, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your experience? Sure. Um, I served for 27 years in the nonprofit community. I have a, master, a bachelor's from the University of Michigan in communication and a master's in nonprofit, nonprofit organizations from Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland. Um, I worked for 27 years in the nonprofit sector in a variety of different roles, primarily in the fundraising side of things, and was the CEO of a nonprofit for um, eight years as well. So I have served in numerous seats in the nonprofit community and then decided to transition into the financial advising, financial planning world where I could really directly help people. And a big part of um, my focus in, in the work that I do is to help nonprofit professionals, organizations, and uh, donors in the work that they're doing. They dedicate uh, so much time and effort and, and commitment to making the world a better place and helping other people that um, I want to make sure that they have an opportunity to be able to help themselves as well. And so I launched Amin to, to really be able to, to do that for people in the sector. And so I'm thrilled to have the opportunity today to share a little bit of knowledge. Good. I'm, I'm so happy. I, 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 um, I'm so happy that we connected with your background and, and this topic is, is just so important. So we're going to start off with uh, our questions because, as you said, it's a lot of information to get through in such a short amount of time. So one of the first questions I have for you is, what benefits can a nonprofit provide um, its employees? Sure. Well, there's there's different types of benefits that a nonprofit can provide. There's uh, there's formal benefits, and then there's informal benefits, and it partly depends on the financial capacity of the organization, the um, the scope of, of work that they're doing. Uh, most most um, employees today in, in in our country look to their employer to provide. Um, common benefits, health insurance, uh, the opportunity for a retirement plan, either formalized or informalized, um, maybe disability insurance, long-term, short-term, um, a whole range of things like that. But not every nonprofit can afford to provide all of those things. So that's where then uh, voluntary opportunities can come into the mix as well either enabling people to, um, to purchase on their own through a trusted advisor, trusted contact the organization may bring in, or through things like financial education and allowing uh, the opportunity for the employees to, to learn about what tools they can put in place for themselves to make sure that they are protected, that they have the opportunities and a whole range of things that, um, that they should have to take care of themselves and their families. And so one of the things that's really been understood is that when employees feel better about themselves, when employees understand their financial situation, feel in control of their financial situation, um, spend less time worrying about their financial situation, the more employees are able to feel comfortable in that space, the more productive they can be. So it really turns out to be a benefit to the organization to provide um, opportunities, both formal and informal, to make sure that the, the level of comfort is as high as possible amongst, amongst the employees to uh, meet the needs of them, the, themselves as individuals and their families, if they have. Okay. 
Thank you for that. That's a very, that's a very detailed answer. And it made me think of things in a different way. So thank you for that. Um, sure. um, when shopping for benefits, how do you compare uh, plans, apples to apples? Well, the, the first thing I would say, and, and I, on a general basis, I think the most important thing is to really understand and be clear. What are you trying to provide to your employees? What do you want to make sure uh, is, is your impact and your, your enhancements on their lives. Um, what do you want to um, make sure they have covered? What do you want to make sure they have taken care of? From that, you then can compare the most critical components. Uh, sometimes when plans are being presented, there are lots of things that are enhancements and above and beyond. And when you get into this type of product, maybe there's a health insurance plan that also provides a variety of other features and, and, and benefits to it, but you may not deem those as important. And so then it's not just a, a dollar to dollar comparison, it's also a comparison of what are the types of programs that are and services that are available to people? Is there an employee assistance program that some companies will provide? Uh, particularly in this day and age, telehealth and, and telemedicine is um, an important benefit. So it's really understanding first what what are you trying to accomplish? What are you what are your goals in sponsoring a plan? And then really having a sense of okay, these things are important, these are not, so that when you're comparing, you're really comparing an apple to an apple. Because if you just look at here's the cost of this and here's the cost of this and this appears to be cheaper. But, and this appears to be more expensive, you may find yourself where that quote unquote more expensive plan is really providing um, more of the things that are truly important to you and it might be worth that additional investment or, or not. And that's where it's important. That's, I think, the most important part, especially for a nonprofit that is really looking to, to be so careful about every dollar that's being spent to really understand what are the benefits that we're providing and what's the impact we're having on our employees and is this something that our employees are going to use and from that you'll really be able to say is this important piece or not um, and even involved in some discussions with the with the provider you know what that piece is not so important to me so what's my pricing if you take that piece out and and i think that's how you really compare them is by looking at what's most important what provides that best incentive and, and enhancement to our to our staff um, and then go from there thank you and um how can a nonprofit begin to budget for benefits especially like health benefits and retirement um the first thing that i would say is is don't presume you have to do it all at once okay um benefit plans pieces can be put in place over a series of years so, and I think that again comes back to what is, if you're transitioning from no plan to having in place a plan, sometimes the answer has to be, okay, we can't go from zero to 100 in, in five seconds. We need to take a, 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 a tiered approach to it. So you may identify, okay, health insurance, for example, is the most important piece that we want to put in first. And we're going to put that in place in year one. Year two, we can add this piece. Year three, we can add this piece because the budgetary demands are going to be um, enable you to steer, stagger that in over time, stage it in over time. So that's one thing I would say first is don't presume it's all or nothing. It can be done in phases. Um, the second part of it is I think really having a, an ongoing um, and clear discussion with the volunteer leadership whether that's the chairperson, the the executive committee, the board, whomever the primary decision makers are relative to the amount of money that's being utilized by the organization for for core purposes, is making sure that they are um, as aware as they should be of the importance and the added value of staff, the the that ongoing dilemma that nonprofits face about percentage of of revenue that's used for overhead versus and administrative expenses versus service. Part of what's important to recognize, and, and I think the, the CEO or executive director, or whatever the, the title within an organization is, part of their responsibility is making sure to really engage with the leadership in a dialogue around one of the tools that we provide that enables us to get our work done is the quality of our staff and the, and the stability of our staff. 
and in, in, in providing a benefit package, whether small or large, whether, you know, a Cadillac or a Chevy or whatever, <laughs> whatever analogy you want to use to, to compare them, the, 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 the pieces that associate with that is part of what helps you bring in quality staff, maintain quality staff. And we all know from, from experience and, from, and anecdotally that having to replace and train new staff is far more expensive than just the, the, the net salary that is paid to that person. Um, the ramp up, all of those pieces are, are uh, a cost to the organization, whether tangible or intangible. So one of those things that helps maintain stability and retain quality staff is having an appropriate benefit program for, for the staff. So part of the ongoing dialogue between, as I said, the, the, the lead professional and the, the key volunteer leadership is, what do we put in place to maintain the quality of the staff that we have. And, um, and here's what it's going to cost us. Here's how we phase it in over time. And that then creates a partnership between the volunteer and the professional about uh, putting it in place and making sure that we, uh, we're not just grabbing for everything, but we're being deliberative, we're being strategic, we're being thoughtful about this and recognizing here's, here's where we go. And it's also taking a look at, as you're building that in, saying we're going to have a combination of, um, of direct benefits and either and voluntary and or educational benefits so that we're not just looking to, to give our employees things that we have to spend money on, but we want to look at the whole employee. We want to make sure that we have opportunities for them to be able to do for themselves, especially in areas that we may not be able to financially afford to put in place for them. That's an awesome awesome answer as you was as you just you know i'm just so appreciative that you're here with your breadth of knowledge and everything that you're everything that you're saying um i just remember budgeting and this is a quick aside i just remember budgeting for our benefits and um and it was like 30 32 percent for each, every full-time employee but we did have all the health the retirement and, and all that and it is a commitment and you do have to talk to your board about it and i love the idea of what you're you're saying you know, you can phase it in tier one, th uh, you know, tier two and have that conversation uh, with your board. That That's a very, very good um, information. Well, and one of the things that I think is important to remember, and it's part of, I think, the discussion between the volunteer and the leadership is as, as social responsibility becomes more and more of not just a buzzword, not just a phrase, but a real framework that our societies are looking at, our corporate societies, our are um, the totalities of our societies and more and more people are looking at how do we not just do well but also do good mm. that uh, the old kind of presumption that the nonprofit sector used to have about the corporate world has this piece piece of the pie and they work on that and the nonprofit sector has this piece and the governmental sector has this piece those lines have become over the last 10 years those lines are beginning are, are becoming um, more and more blurred over time. And we can highlight numerous examples of, of companies that are still keeping themselves as for-profit entities, but are putting in place uh, activities that they have that are quote unquote socially responsible mm -hmm. and are having them be good corporate citizens. And so as they're doing more and more of that, the pool of people that would traditionally look only to the nonprofit or governmental sectors for their employment are, are having opportunities to look at the corporate sector for opportunities to do good and yes. to do and to contribute to society. That poses a challenge to the nonprofit sector with regard to we've got to be competitive. As we know, most nonprofit professionals are willing to take a, a lower salary that they might take in the corporate world because they want to be part of making impact in, in people's lives. But that doesn't mean that they're willing to forego everything exactly. um, in doing that. So that's where it's critically important for nonprofits to really say, we have to treat our, our um, one of our most, if not our most valuable asset, which is our people, Yes, we have to treat them in a way that's going to at least allow us to have some level of, of competitiveness in the framework with regard to those who might otherwise be looking to hire them. 
And so, yeah, we know we're not going to pay them as much money, but there are other things we can do to keep and retain them. And one of those is the formal benefits plan, and another is the informal benefits piece, so that at least the employee feels the ability to have themselves be empowered to understand and to know about these are the actions I can be taking for myself, these are the ones that I have to take for myself, and these are the ones that my employer is helping me do for myself. But at least they're helping me have a full level of knowledge and awareness and understanding of what I'm doing, why I'm doing it, and what I should be doing that they're not able to do with and for me. Great. So that leads us to question number four. If your nonprofit does not offer a plan, what are the key steps um, a person can do to create a successful plan for retirement? Sure. Well, I think the, the, the first part of that is to recognize that thinking about and planning for retirement needs to start today. Um, that even for a person who's in the very, very, very first job that they have out of school, um, they're just, it's the first time they're breaking away from home. And it's the first time that they are full-time working on their own behalf and they're earning their own living. That's a time to start thinking about retirement. Partly because retirement involves, when most people think about retirement, most people think about money mm -hmm. and they think about finances. Well, there's, so the piece of that that does relate to money, money needs time to work. Money needs time to be able to accumulate and to grow and all of that has a compounding um, factor involved in it. So that needs time. But the other piece of it that also has to start and, and evolve over time is, is what does retirement mean? And for every single person, it's different. I'll use myself as an example. I don't ever anticipate what I would call a full retirement. Um, I love what I do. Um, I love having a purpose. I love having meaning. Um, I love having, having that, uh, that push to, to get out of bed and help people on a, on a daily basis. And I don't ever see fully stopping that. Um, but the ability to have a retirement plan to fall back on gives freedom and flexibility and the ability to say, okay, so, so I don't want to fully stop working, but because I have enough accumulated in savings, I can work half time instead of full time. And that becomes empowered. So it's having an awareness in yourself and this is going to evolve over time. So, you know, when a 23, 24 year old, like, uh, like one of my kids says to me, um, well, how do I think about retirement? I'm just starting to work. Well, it's going to evolve over time. But since money needs time to work for you and to accumulate and compound and grow, uh, your envision of what retirement is going to look like is also going to do that. But it should be thinking about what's important to you in retirement. What, when do you want to transition? Do you want to try to retire early? Do you want to try to retire late? Do you want to, you know, all of those pieces so that at any point in time, you have a bit of a target as to what you're looking for, which then enables you to put in place the time frame for it and to know, here's what I'm looking for in, in, in time frame. Here's where I think I'm going. And I need to be at such and such place at a certain time to enable me to stay on target. And I need to be here. I need to be here. I need to be here over the course of time. And the only way you can do that is, um, I, li I like to use the example, and, and for and the younger and younger people are, the harder it is to relate to this. Uh, but the old AAA triptych that you used to go into AAA and say, "I'm driving from." <laughs> it looks like you're not, you're not remembering that either. Before before MapQuest and before Google Maps existed, okay. <laughs> if you wanted to go from point A to point B, and it was like a road trip. You could go into AAA and say, I'm going here. How do, what's the best way to get there? And they would take out these section by section by section maps and they would take out their stamps and they would stamp on it, um, watch for speed zone or watch for construction or watch for things like that. Um, but the important part of that and, 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 and the important part of Google Maps or MapQuest or any of those things, the same way that you can't go from, um, in my case, San Antonio to anywhere you know, if I just get in the car and drive, I may want to go to Dallas, but I could end up in El Paso. <laughs> so, so we, to be able to do appropriate and correct retirement planning, I have to know what I'm trying to accomplish in retirement, and I have to know by when I want to accomplish it. So it's, it's very much along the same lines of uh, if, if, if you can't get somewhere that you don't know where you're trying to go. And that's why I think it's very important to start not just looking at it from a financial perspective, but also from a 
what does it mean to me perspective? And again, that's going to change a lot over the course of time. Um, as people get married, as, as um, health impact, there's all sorts of things that impact that. So it's not a static one time in, in your life, here's the final answer, here's, here's what we're going to do, and then leave it alone. It's here's where we think we're going to be based on today's realities, and here's what I need to accumulate to, to provide that for myself. Um, and the next time you have the discussion, it may be a little bit different. The next time, you know, a few years from now when you have that, it may look totally different. But when you have an accumulation of assets, you have the ability to, to, to tweak and to readjust the, the balance of what's being done with that. If you wait for 10 years to start the process, it just means you have to work that much harder to accomplish the same end result. Good. Um, so, hey, if you're just joining us, welcome to our broadcast. Uh, we're currently talking about um, benefits and uh, retirement. And actually, Adam has been throwing out some great nuggets. Um, I, I would suggest that you go back and, and look at this if you didn't catch it from the beginning. I've actually learned something throughout this process. And don't forget, um, uh, if you could click the hearts or like, or let us know where, you, where you're looking at. I see everybody out there. Thank you, Melissa, Gerald, um, Genesis, um, for joining us. Um, we are so excited to have you here, and, and thank you for letting us uh, know. And um, yeah, Gerald said it was MapQuest 1.0 on paper. So <laughs> I, had no idea. I had no idea about the AAA thing. So, um, um, so um, but thank you all for joining us out there. So, um, Adam, when should you start planning? You kind of already answered this one, but um, kind of let us know, when should you start planning for retirement? Well, as I was mentioning, the time, the time is, is, I think, now. Mm -hmm. and, and, and what I would add to that is I would also look at retirement in stages. Um, as we enter retirement, and, and I frequently work with clients and work with individuals on three different phases of retirement. And I, I tend to break them down into roughly 10-year segments, uh, but they don't have to be 10-year segments. It's just um, I find that three is the right number to work on for it. There's that immediate stage of retirement where you're finished working, you're generally in a position where you can still maintain a high level of activity, you have an active lifestyle, you may want to volunteer, you may want to travel, you may want to visit family, you may have new hobbies you want to pursue. You're going to be very active in that. And, and, and that's going to imp there's going to be an implication for where are there activities that you could do that you're interested in doing. So that stage of, of retirement life is going to impact where you live and the kinds of things that you're doing and, and that stage. Then there's this next phase of retirement where you're going to begin to be less active, uh, your health may have begun to, to impact you where you want to begin to slow down on things. Uh, your social circle may begin to be a little bit narrower. Unfortunately, people may have died. Um, people, people may have moved on to other places to be with children or any, any sort of thing. But we definitely see as people continue to age in retirement, their circles tend to become smaller and smaller. Um, and their focus and in, in the time and attention is, is on really embracing and, and participating in the things that they enjoy the most in their lives, whether it's volunteering for key organizations or um, giving back to society in, in mm -hmm. other kinds of ways uh, and, and participating in that. And then the third stage of it is really where um, you may become much more sedentary. You may have been, you, you may have some physical limitations, some physical issues that um, you may really want to be spending your time with friends, family, close community. Um, you, you either need to help care for a loved one or you may want to just engage with loved ones on a, on a much more limited time frame. So as you look at those three stages, again, each of those has implications for the kind of, of financial requirement and obligation that's going to be involved in that. And far too, far too frequently, I find when people think about retirement, they think only about the financial, the, the kind of number in retirement. They don't think about what is that number and what is that money trying to accomplish. And the better able we are to kind of look at those stages of what retirement, and that's why, uh, that's one of many reasons why I think that it, there's no time like the present even to begin to look and think about it is, 
to begin to envision and, and to imagine where and what might I be doing in the different phases and what is it going to take to enable me to successfully do those kinds of things. And, and again, the sooner that you start doing it, the easier that you have the ability to avoid other challenges in life. So go back to the 23 year old first job out of college or out of uh, trade school or whatever sort of education they may have first job out of high school so yeah in any any phase and they may think about well i i could just take all the money i have and go play <laughs> well sure you can and that may be important to you but as you move on through life there are other other things that are going to compete for those same dollars whether it's a, it's building a family and we know um we know the impact and the demands that, that children can place on our financial uh, abilities. Uh, we know housing demands can play, you know, you go from renting a place to buying and owning a place and then the air conditioner goes down and all of a sudden now you got a multi-thousand dollar bill, et cetera. So, so for multiple reasons, including the fact that compounding money really helps you grow and that's why sooner, but two, the less obligations you have for your money the better positioned you are to begin that accumulation. So if you start sooner and start um, putting aside the maximum that you can when you're younger and allowing that to work for itself, then when there are greater demands for your money and maybe you aren't able to put in the maximum into those retirement plans. Again, I'm focusing kind of on the question that you raised about if my employer can't put this in place for me, how do I take care of myself? And so um, you have those limitations in terms of what the government allows you to set aside for retirement accounts and things like that. So if you can match those out in your younger years, and you may not be able to because of competing demands for that money in your kind of middle stage lifetime, you may only be able to put a portion in, you'll still have the compounding benefit of what you did in your earlier stages. So that's why it's so critically important to be thinking about what can I do today to help provide for my retirement in the future. And I think the last thing I would say about that is, is the reminder to people, retirement is one of those handful of things in life that you cannot borrow money for. You can borrow money for college. You could borrow money to pay for your house. You could borrow money for to go on a trip. And I mean, whether it's advisable to borrow money for some of these things or not is one question, but the reality is, you can borrow money for lots of activities in life like those things. You cannot borrow money for retirement. So retirement has to, in the minds of, of a lot of people, kind of play uh, a critically important role as part of thinking about how do I accumulate and how do I plan and address my future situation. And that's why I keep coming back to the idea that no matter what age you are, um, and, and whether you're playing catch up because you've started later or whether you're starting sooner, which will give you more time there's no time like the present to begin to address that. Yeah, that's a great point. You cannot you cannot borrow for retirement. Um, so um, I got uh, two more questions here. So what is Social Security? Because you, you, you mentioned some people might have started late. So what is Social Security and how will it play in, into um, a retirement plan? Sure. Social Security is really, it's, it's not a one size fits all okay. plan for everybody. And I think that's, one of the challenges is that people sometimes think of, of uh, Social Security as it's the same thing for everybody. Well, it's, it's really not. Um, first of all, it's, it's one of those things that you have to accumulate a certain amount of time in a job to be able to have accumulated benefits, benefits for. And assuming that you've accumulated um, the sufficient number of, of, of credits for the program, which just from technical perspective is 40, which is roughly 10 years of work, uh, and the longer you work, the greater your benefits are. Okay. Um, it provides you an income for life. And that income for life can be passed on to um, spouses, whether um, current or former, um, same sex or, or different sex. There are benefits to that can be accumulated for each of for each of them. Uh, and and there's technicalities and details that are involved in this. So I'm, I'm really describing kind of at what I would call the 10,000 foot level. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but what it is, it's, it's a place where a portion of your, of your income, the government is, is setting aside into a, the equivalent of a trust fund for people in, in later in life. Mm 
for their retirement. Now, the other part of it that's not a one size fits all is what you get from that retirement in, in large measure can be determined by when you start to, um, to withdraw those benefits. So you can start to take Social Security benefits before the full retirement age, where you'll get less than 100% of your, your entitled benefit. Mm -hmm. um, if you take it at full retirement age, you'll get more. That you'll get the, the the benefit you're entitled to, and you can get a statement every every year that shows you exactly where, based on the number of credits and the amount of money you've put into the system, this is what your um, your Social Security income would look like. Uh, so then you would get that benefit, and if you decide to take late withdrawal from from that, so if you defer uh, your the money that you take out of Social Security then you'll have the opportunity to have a little bit more than what your your um, full benefit would be. But it's all based on kind of what you've had put into the system and uh, and the amount that you earned and contributed to that. And then how does that play out over the course of your lifetime in okay. retirement? Remind me again, what is the retirement age? Um, it's uh, 67. And they keep pushing it up every year, huh? It was 65 at some point, no? Correct. Okay. Correct. And now it's for everybody. Well, it's 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 tiered. For everybody who's born after 1959, full retirement is 67. If you were born before 59, it varies. If you were born before 55, full retirement is 66, um, and then it's kind of pro rata in between there. And and none of us know for sure. There's still certainly talk about pushing it to age 70 and and beyond and you know, as, as people as people live longer and and people are healthier and we certainly see plenty of people who live into their 90s and and into their early hundreds uh, and that's part of also the rationale by which in, in some of my earlier comments I was talking about three stages because if you retire at 65 or 67 it's not uncommon to live for 30 years and so 30 years in retirement, while well, your needs in your early 90s are going to be very different than your needs at age 68 or 69. And you can't, you can't accomplish, you can't look at what money do I need at age 68 or 69, and how is that going to compare to what I need at age 90 or 92. Uh, so that's why you have to kind of piecemeal and look at, um, and look at things from a different perspective on all of those different phases. That's true. That's true. I hadn't thought about that. So here's our last question. And we actually are doing okay on time with 1032. <laughs> so, um, but this is a very important conversation. We have a lot of engagement on Facebook. Um, so um, what retirement risks should uh, someone plan for? Sure. Uh, there, there are a number of them. And, and um, you know, if you really stop and think about, so I retire at age 67. If I retire early at 62, retire at 65, 67, 70, you know, whatever age I retire. So what are the things that could pose challenges to, to what I have available in retirement? One, one is I live longer than I had planned for. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't put in place a plan for how am I going to use my money, starting with withdrawal. And so I take too much of it each year in the first 10, 15 years of retirement. And now I have nothing left. So... So there's, there's the risk of living longer than what you planned for. There is inflation risk. So that the cost of something today, 10, 15, 20 years from now, is going to cost more. Um, healthcare costs. As we get older, we typically get um, less healthy. And um, while modern medicine has continued to allow us to live longer and longer and longer, it also means that there's... Um, uh, that doesn't mean that we're necessarily living at the highest level of health through all of those years. We may be living in a, in a more frail state than, um, than we had been in, in our working adult lifestyle. And so there may be dramatically increased healthcare costs. Um, depending on how we have our money invested or allocated, the market can go up, down, uh, stay flat. And so we have to be careful about what could happen with, um, with volatility of where our money is. On the flip side, you could have, if your money is just left into a, into like a savings account, that's not earning any money. And then you've got the inflation risk. And if for 10 years you've had it earning nothing, now 
you're going to have to take out and, and the last risk would be that you take out more than you really can afford to take if you want to project that money out for the entirety of your retirement. So if you take those excessive withdrawals, now your money is going to be depleted faster. So it's really a combination of all of those different kinds of things. And that's another, you know, taking it again back to the three stages of retirement that I like to come back to to, to, to those and in, in talking about this with people because in those three stages, you can begin to address different of these components. You can address um, what are my healthcare costs going to look like first 10 years, second 10 years, third 10 years? How do I manage um, the risk of, of market volatility? So if I know that I'm setting aside money that I'm not planning on using for 20 years, maybe I can be um, a little bit less cautious with that money than money that I may need in two weeks. Um, and, and a whole range of things that allow you to really align your money with the purposes to try to minimize the risk that you have in retirement in, in those you know, areas that I was highlighting. Perfect. So um, let me, I'm going to check and see if we have any questions um, on o, over here. Um, no, but I get a lot of uh, thank you for today, Adam. You have, you know, provided some, a lot of great information. Um, and they uh, comments about thank you for saying that at any stage you can do uh, start retirement. So we got a lot of engagement um, on that about the information that you're providing. Um, but I will say to the group, um, if a question comes up later that um, hasn't come to mind right now, feel free to, to place the comment um, here and Adam will get back with you. He's very thorough and this is some great information. Um, but one of the most common questions I get um, is around fundraising um, for your nonprofit. And if you do have any fundraising questions, the next step you can do is visit my website at um, www.supportingworldhope.com to check out my services. Um, and if you're watching um, this in rebroadcast and you have a question or comment, please uh, put it there and we will get back with you. Again, I'm getting a lot of inf uh, a lot of kudos to you, Adam, about the awesome yeah. information. And um, they, they, they want to thank you for your insight and your, and your recommendations. Um, so I really appreciate you being here today. And uh, I, really, I really learned something from all the information. If anybody wanted to get in contact with you, can you share your information? Absolutely. Um, my email is adamschwartz at financialguide.com. Um, and my, um, my phone number is 210-384-5310. And um, I just want to thank you for the opportunity. And to the people who I can't see who are participating, um, I want to thank you. I know, as, as I mentioned before, after having spent 27 years in the, in the sector, um, having my master's uh, in, in the sector, um, I recognize the commitment and the, the sacrifices and the, um, the, the incredible work that's being done by everybody in the sector. It's, it's a significant part of why I, I really wanted to make sure that I continue to provide and to work with people who are doing so much important work for others and why I've made as a, as a part of my commitment in my practice to always be available for people who are, who are doing good for others mm -hmm. and to help them out. Uh, if, I can, if I can help um, even one person avoid the issue, gosh, if only I knew then what I know now yeah. because of a conversation I had and my, my, my personal life is better because of learning that, that a little bit more. Um, then I will have felt um, enriched and, and, and blessed to provide an opportunity for others because each and every one of you who is, who is serving in, in the nonprofit sector is, is giving so much back and, and doing, doing your part of making the world a better place. And so I appreciate, um, I wish I could see everybody yeah. <laughs> is, is participating and, and thank you each individually and personally, but, but please do know that I do um, recognize what you're doing and deeply, deeply appreciate what you're doing and um, say thank you and, and keep it up.
Thank you. Thank you. So to the crowd out there, if there's a topic you want to hear about, um, hit me up on Facebook um, on my page and let me know. Um, we're always looking for uh, great uh, speakers and great content like Adam just provided. Um, you can also uh, tap the, the button so you'll know the next time that I go live. And, you, and I'll, I will also put this video on um, the YouTube channel and it'll be up on the website so that you can see it at any time. And Actually, I would encourage you to share this with your board of directors. This is just one of those conversations that need to be started and need to be had. And I will leave you with this. Um, your mission matters. It deserves to be highlighted in the community. Your mission matters and can be an inspiration to those who need it the most. Your mission matters and deserves to be funded at its fullest capacity. And that's Sipping Tea with Sabrina and see you next time.